worship you. I worship you. You are here, moving in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are way back, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God.
darkness, my God, that is who you are. We make miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you
cross to die but not even death itself could hold you down for you rose to life such an awesome God so mighty so You're such an awesome God, so selfless, so generous, so faithful you are, such an awesome God, You're such an awesome God. Such an awesome God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, my Lord. Praise you. Praise you. Praise you. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Grace. Thanks for joining us here online. Uh, another week uh, to go, but uh, another few weeks to go, but uh, thankful that uh, we get to be able to do this. And uh, so I appreciate you being here. A um, couple announcements to run through. Um, first is that uh, starting again on Wednesday uh, at 10 o'clock next Wednesday, we're going to be jumping on Zoom, doing a prayer meeting. Uh, like we were earlier in the in the last lockdown. So if you'd like to join us, 10 o'clock, we will see you there. The Zoom link should be already in your inbox uh, if you are part of uh, the email chain. So hopefully, if you're looking for more information, you can obviously just write us at info at igrace.ca. I want to thank you for giving and encourage you to do that uh, if, you, if you haven't. And uh, just bless you as you do that. Your, your offering and your giving to God is just much appreciated. We just uh, encourage everybody to, um, to think through that, pray through that. And then <clears throat> as well, uh, at the end of the service, we started last week and it, it, was, it was awesome. We're excited to keep doing it. We've got a lot of uh, uh, capable people ready to go in the prayer room. We're doing a post-service prayer time. So of course, we're going to be jumping online on Facebook Live and doing our sermon or kind of a service follow-up and conversation and questions. So keep those comments coming or really enjoying the conversation. But we are also doing Zoom prayer. So that means you'll be, uh, you just go on the Zoom link, type in the password, and you can, uh, you'll be ushered into a room. Well, there'll be a couple of people uh, that would love to pray with you after the service for, for really for anything. And I want to encourage you, and it doesn't need to be a crisis. It doesn't need to be, you know, the end of the world. We just want to encourage you. There's people that are, are excited just to pray for you, agree with you, maybe just bless you. And uh, so I uh, invite you to do that. So all you need to do is click the link, uh, which will be in the comments here if it's on Facebook as well. Uh, it'll be in the YouTube uh, details. And the password is grace, lowercase, plus the date, which this week would be 0124. So grace 0124 is the password to get into the Zoom uh, prayer. So I in invite you to do that. And as well... Uh, we haven't done communion in a, in a long time because of the, uh, the, the kind of hang-ups around COVID and sharing stuff. But because we're at home and you're hanging out, we want to encourage you next week, we're going to do communion at the end of the service. And so uh, if you want to be ready for that with some, uh, something uh, to, to drink and then something to eat, uh, hopefully some bread and maybe grape juice, wine, whatever. And uh, we'd love to, to do that with you. So just remember that for next week. I'll tease you at the beginning of the service to remind you. Awesome. Well, why don't we take a moment and pray and ask God to open up our hearts, to give us eyes and ears, eyes to see, ears to hear. And uh, we'll jump into our text today. So God, 
I thank you for this opportunity. I thank you that uh, you've gathered your church, even though we are digital in, in various places, Lord, all over Center Wellington and Guelph and wherever we may be watching. I thank you that you've gathered your church and you're wanting to speak your word to us, Lord. We thank you that uh, we don't need to live in fear, but we can live in rest in your love. And so I thank you this morning that we are ready to hear uh, the challenge of your word. We're ready to consider it for our lives. And I ask God that this would bear fruit, Lord, that it would, it would hit uh, good soil. And I ask, Lord, that you would make and prepare a way, Lord, we ask, Holy Spirit, that you'd be ministering to us, help us to, to make sense, Lord. I pray that you'd even surprise us. We, we, just, we just know, Lord, your work this morning uh, goes beyond what we can uh, think or imagine. So I pray, Lord, you'd surprise us, Holy Spirit, that you'd whisper in our souls and that we'd come alive in your name. Amen. Awesome. Well, I want to read uh, this morning our next passage uh, again in Mark is Mark chapter 6. And it's verse 7, and we're jumping into another two stories, another sandwich again. And so uh, Mark 6, uh, verse 7, and I'm reading out of the ESV, and so this is the story. And he called the twelve, and he began to send them out two by two, and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. And he said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if you place, if any place will not receive you and they will not listen to you, when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony that is against them. So when they went out, so they went out and proclaimed that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. King Herod heard of it. For Jesus' name had become known. Some said John the Baptist had been raised from the dead, and that is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. But others said he is Elijah. And others said he is the prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was righteous and holy, a righteous and holy man. And so he kept him safe. When he heard, he was greatly perplexed. When he heard John, and this is Herod listening to John, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. But an opportunity came when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. For when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, ask me for whatever you wish and I will give it to you. And he vowed to her, whatever you ask me, I'll give it to you up to half my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, for what should I ask? And she said, the head of John the Baptist. And she came in immediately with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry. But because of his oaths and his guests, he did not want to break his word to her. And immediately the king sent an, ex an executioner with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl and the girl gave it to her mother. When the disciples, his disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. And the apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. Well, with all of that in mind, and we're going to get into those two stories in just a moment, I wanted to begin, just set the stage by talking about a little 32-page booklet that was first published in the 1960s uh, by an author named Charles Hummel. The title is called The Tyranny of the Urgent. Some of you may uh, have heard of it. Some of you may have even read it. Um, upon its release in 1960, it became an instant business classic. 
But what, 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 I want us to, what I want us to realize this morning is that its message has a much wider application. And the simple argument that Charles Hummel lays out, that he outlines in his book, is that there's an ongoing tension in all of our lives between things that are urgent and things that are important. Things that are urgent and things that are important. How many have felt that tension in, in your life? between urgency and, and, the, and the deeper things that are more important. And that tension in our lives is the fight to prioritize for us what matters most. What matters most in your life? And the question we want to ask is, is that the priority that someone would be able to understand from looking at your life? If that's the most important thing. It should have the highest priority. And our struggle happens when those urgent matters, those through the less important, get prioritized in the place of the more important, simply because they're demanding your attention, because they're right in front of you. It's the tyranny of the urgent. Now, we've all experienced the frustration of when that happens in our lives, when we find ourselves not doing really what we want to do. It comes when we, you know, when we slip into that state of, of just servicing what's in front of us rather than, than, and then anchoring ourselves in what matters most. When we live our lives misaligned in our priorities. Now it happens all the time and it happens in lots of ways. It happens in our businesses. It happens in our marriages. It happens in the work that we do. It happens in the study that, we, that, we, that we're undertaking. It happens in our families and of course, it happens in our life with God. Philosopher and theologian Dallas Willard was once asked, and Dallas Willard makes a second appearance in a row, uh, in, in, in a, in a second appearance in a week. He was once asked by a man that he was discipling. They're on the phone, and the man says to him, Dallas, what do I need to do to become the me that I want to be? What do I need to do to become the me that I want to be? And as it was with, with Willard, who's, who's now passed, there's a long silence on the other end of the line as he thought through the question. And then he said this. He said, you must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. Now the man listening scribbled it down on a paper and then proceeded to ask another question. So what else do I need to do? Silence. Longer silence. Silence. Finally, Willard responds, and he says, there is nothing else. Hurry is the great enemy of spiritual life in our day. You must ruthlessly eliminate it from your life. Willard went on to say this about hurry. He said, it is the state of frantic effort one falls into in response to inadequacy, fear, and guilt. And what I want us to realize, what I want us to, to connect together today is that giving into the tyranny of the urgent, the pressing hurry that our world, you know, disciples us in, <laughs> that only happens when we live disconnected from God's vision for our lives. If you're giving into it, it's because you're disconnected from the vision that God has for your life. If you are confused about your purpose right now, if you're thinking, I don't, I just, I wonder, I don't know if I know what I'm supposed to do, you will always live short of your purpose if you're confused about it. You've heard it said, without vision, a people perish. And it's true. When we are not captivated, when we're not enthralled or caught up in a vision of the world as it could be, when we're not caught up, um, in the people that we are and are becoming in Christ, when that vision is not in front of us, we end up doing all sorts of crazy things. We end up, first of all, wasting our time. We end up getting caught up in endless, busy work. Com we end up compromising our values. We end up not doing what we want to do. We feel anxious on the inside. We, we wear ourselves out. And ultimately, what we do is we end up as slaves to our whims, right? We, can be, we become susceptible to them. When we don't have purpose, we become slaves to our whims. You know, we default to our weaknesses and our, and our unordered desires. 
And that's the problem that's so clearly contrasted in the two stories that we just read. Jesus' way in the first story, and then Herod's way. Both of them have fruit. One lives as a victim. It's Herod. He's an onlooker to his life, a passenger in the journey of his life where things happen to him. He's always reacting. He's always compensating. He's always making up for, always catching up with things. But the other way, Jesus' way, he represents the one who, you know, if you look at Jesus' life, he lives his life as a hero on a mission. Jesus is the hero of a story that is unfolding in his life. He has a vision. He's an overcomer. He's a solution to problems, not reacting to them. He's the captain at the helm of his life, caught up in a vision, with a vision of the world as it could be. And he's courageously charting a course towards that. He's looking at it saying, that's where I'm going. And what I want us to see this morning is that not only are we commissioned, called into that way that Jesus models for us, but that the pathway to get there, into that life, comes through sacrifice. It comes with being ruthless. So come with me. Let's let's look at the passage. Uh, We want to begin by fleshing out some of the storyline so we we can really make make the most of it. Because the word, when we come to it, sometimes we don't know what's there, but the word is powerful. It speaks to things that we, that we, we only discover when we study and we, we get our minds and we immerse our minds into it as we open our hearts. So let's do that together this morning. The storyline that we want to flesh out so we can understand the contrast that Mark is making here, if you, if you, if you haven't guessed it yet, or I guess I alluded to it already, is it's that we've got another Scheibungen, uh, an, a, just a German you know, scholarly word uh, for a story sandwich. It's a literary device. And the first section starts, the first story starts in verse 7 with the story about Jesus sending out 12 disciples. And, you know, the story goes forward and then it's interrupted before they they return to Jesus uh, in verse 14 by a second story about King Herod who hears about Jesus' work. And it's a story of him and John the Baptist. And then it concludes in verse 30 with the disciples coming back. It just ends by saying, and they came back to Jesus. And what we learned already in the past few weeks that we've been looking in Mark's gospel and looking at how he uses these uh, story sandwiches to to help us understand the word, the two stories are actually meant to be linked together and they're actually meant to help interpret one another. So the meaning of the, or the the, the fullness of the first one is understood when we grab grab a hold of the middle story. And so the question we want to ask is, how do the two stories work together? What does Jesus' mission and Herod murdering John have to do with each other? How do they help us? And this is the question we want to ask. How do they help us understand living a a life full of vision and sacrifice? How do they help us understand that? The problem we have to face in answering that, though, because we run into a problem right away, is that the power or the force of the first story, Jesus sending up the twelve, is somewhat hidden from us because of familiarity. Now, I know we talked about familiarity a few weeks ago, but I want to just bring it up again because familiarity with the word actually stops us or hinders us from actually seeing the force or feeling the force of the story. What I mean is, when the story begins in verse 7, tell me if this isn't true. Listen to what Jesus gives to the disciples. Listen to what he imparts to them because it's important. It says this, he called the 12 and he began to send them out two by two. We all know that. 12, they go out two by two. And then it says, and he gave them authority over unclean spirits. We're to pay attention here <laughs> because though the disciples end up, it tells us, you know, they proclaim the gospel, they call people to repentance, they do heal the sick and anoint them, they, they build relationships and they share meals with people in their homes. One specific thing that, we, uh, that they are given by Jesus that, that is going to be integral to their task is authority over unclean spirits. I mean, that's... Now, I'm, I'm not going to argue with Jesus, but I just kind of wonder when you read it, it stuck out to me. Shouldn't it be something less specific than that? Shouldn't he have, you know, given them his love or given them his grace? 
What about, why is it authority? And if they're going to heal, why didn't he give them power to heal? Why is it authority over unclean spirits? It's a good question. And it's one we, we want to ask ourselves now. As you live for Jesus, how high on your list of priorities is receiving and operating in the authority of God? How often is that at the, you know, at the peak of your devotional life? How, how often is it the, the topic of your prayer? What does it mean? What might that mean for us? I think it's a, it's a stone in our contemporary Christian shoe, this whole idea of authority. It's something everybody kind of goes, oh, like, I, I don't know what that, it sounds kind of highfalutin. I, I don't know what that means. What I think it reminds us of is the reality that you can only live without authority when you are living functionally disconnected from God's vision and mission for your life. I should say that again. You, only, you, can, you can only live without authority when you're living disconnected from God's vision and mission for your life. You don't need to wear a coat if you never go outside. In the same way, you don't need authority if you're never really going to join in God's work of advancing and, 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 and living out life in the kingdom. If you're never going to be a witness, you don't need to open your mouth. How many of us wake up thinking, Lord, as I wake up today, as I live for you today, what I need you to impart to me is that authority. Give me the authority this morning, Lord, because I know that today there are people that you want to use, you want to, that you want to set free through my life, through my words, through my love, through my service. There are people that you want to impact. These verses help us think about if we've really grasped the vision that Jesus has been carrying and was carrying within himself as he walked the earth. Have we grasped it? Or are we endlessly hurrying, caught up in the less important but urgent tasks of our lives? Here's a question. What if we perpetuated the idea? What if our lives were just another you know, step in that direction, that we could, the idea that we could live our whole Christian life without learning or needing the authority that Jesus gave to you. And that's the problem we face. If you've read the sto these stories for years, you can lose your grip on what, it, we can lose our grip on what matters most. We can become victims of familiarity, victims of a hurry that robs us of the vision that scripture lays before us and presents to us. So when you read it, I'm going to guess this. You likely didn't give any special notice to the fact that Jesus specifically chose 12 disciples. But that's really important. It's really important because it's, it's, actually, it's actually one of the big messages in the Gospels. Is It's signaling and connecting us to the mission of the 12 tribes of Israel. That's what Jesus is doing. He's, he's, he's pointing back, saying, remember those guys had a mission? And I'm now doing that again. And this is what I want us to... To, to ask, did you realize that Israel, the nation of Israel, had a mission? They had a calling. Did you realize that the whole story that we have in the Old Testament, starting in Genesis 12, about Israel, do you know what that is? It's God's gracious and patient response to the idolatry that happened in, through all the nations at, at Babel. When they rejected God at Babel, when they said, we're going we're to make a name for ourselves. We're going to keep ourselves safe. We don't need you. We're going to seek other gods. God disinherited them there. And that's what he does in Genesis 12 is he raises up Abraham. He raises up a family for himself. And the, and the thing is, Israel failed though. Abraham's descendants, Israel and the 12 tribes, they failed to accomplish their, their, their job always compromised by sin. And what was their mission, though? What was their mission? What was God doing in them? They were called to be a light to the nations. See, God called Abraham out of the nations to be his special people, to be the, the hope for the nations, a gateway of God's blessing, a kingdom, a family of priests. They were going to be priests to the nations who would be witnesses to the world that the God of everything wanted to reconcile this world back to himself. They were to be living examples, messages, witnesses of hope that God had not given up on humanity. So 
That verse should be ringing in our ears when we read it. The 12 apostles are Jesus' own renewed version of Israel, sent out into the world to restore and reconcile what had been lost from the beginning. But it's not that easy. It's not that easy just to reclaim. That's, that's why Israel failed. Because there's a struggle that, that, the, that the disciples, the apostles, have to overcome. They must usurp first the powers of darkness that rule the nations and keep the people of the world in darkness. And that is why they needed authority. Because when humanity gave up their, you know, when they, they started worshiping idols, when they functionally trusted in things outside of God, the worship the created things rather than the creator. When they did that, what they did was they actually gave up their authority. They, they actually, you know, surrendered it. And they became enslaved to sin and death and to Satan. And so what they needed was someone who was stronger, someone with authority. And so the biblical story tells us the problem of this world isn't just that humanity has sinned. That's only part of the story. It's that we sin because we were tempted by evil. Because there wasn't just a human rebellion, there was a divine rebellion, an angelic rebellion. Jesus comes to deal with both human and angelic or heavenly rebellion. And when we read about that, it's that same familiarity that works against us because we don't realize, listen, how noteworthy it is that all of a sudden, all of a sudden, casting out demons plays a big role in Jesus' stories. And it just happens. All of a sudden, see what's before. In the entirety of the Old Testament, there's not a single example of exorcism. No one casts out demons in the Old Testament. It is only ever hinted at. Yet in Jesus' ministry, it's happening almost every other moment. I mean, we haven't been able to read, I don't think, a story yet in Mark that somehow isn't related to casting out demons. I feel like we're talking about it a lot. Everywhere Jesus goes, what happens? Demons cry out. Demons flee. And the question we want to ask ourselves, we don't, we're familiar with this. We don't realize how, how, how different it is. N.T. Wright says, the question we want to ask is why. N.T. Wright says this. He says, Jesus' continual, continual work of exorcism, exorcism signaled something far deeper was going on in his ministry. He wasn't just a prophet. Namely, the battle of Jesus' ministry was not a round of, of, of fierce debates with the keepers of orthodoxy. He wasn't just fighting with the Pharisees or the Sadducees or the scribes. But he was having, and this is what N.T. Wright says, a head-on war with Satan. This is what we know. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. Jesus knew that once you bind the strong man, you can plunder his entire house. We must realize as Christians, we were not saved through wise and persuasive words. We're saved because the light of Jesus broke into our hearts and the darkness could not overcome it. It was a spiritual salvation. It was a spiritual deliverance. And that's what the disciples knew. They they knew they would go out to preach and they would go out and lay their hands and anoint the sick and they'd be healed. But they knew as they did it that it wasn't their power. It, was, it wasn't their authority. It was the authority and the power of Jesus reclaiming and reconciling the world back to himself. Merrill Unger, he's a, 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 he was a pr- professor emeritus of Old Testament at uh, Dallas Theological Seminary. And he tells a story told to him by one of his, his missionary friends of the Yin family a mother and a father and three sons who lived uh, poor villagers uh, in, in China's mainland. And the story goes that one day Mrs. Yin, as she's working outside, she fell and she hit her head. And her injury left her paralyzed. And in the aftermath, she actually fell into, an, fell into an, a coma that she, she didn't come out of. You know, living in you know, a remote village without any proper hospital or medical help, Mr. Yin is left only with prayer. Prayer, of course, not to, to Yahweh or to Jesus, but prayer to his household gods. And, and then also he would pray and he would travel to the, the nearby Buddhist temple where they would charge him for access to a priest who would then pray with him and for his wife. 
Eventually, as he's going to that temple, he runs out of money, so he can't go back. He has, he has no options anymore. He's despairing. And, and, and in, the, in his despair, he hears word from, from friends in a nearby village, in the next village over, that there was people in that village that would pray for you, but they didn't require any money in return. Daring to believe that this could be true, Mr. Yin sets out on the day's journey to, to find out for himself. And, and, and yes, the people say when he meets them, they, they're missionaries and they ask no money. However, they did require one thing. And it wasn't a small ask. They required that he remove all of his household gods because God, to whom they prayed, would not tolerate their presence nor would he share credit for his work. Mr. Yin says, okay, I'll do it. They arrive the next day and they find the entire village gathered around the house because Mr. Yin is causing a commotion. He has begun to take out his precious, you know, idols, gods, you know, household gods and brought them out and placed them outside the house, just in the rain, out in, in the sun. And they know enough to ask him again, have you brought it all your gods? And he says, actually, no, they're still, they're still you know, the kitchen god. And so embarrassed, he, he goes inside and he, he brings that out too. And I mean, the air is palpable around him. Everybody can't believe what he's doing. It, it's a sight. There's a stack of idols outside the house as the village, the whole village looks on. And so they enter in, finally, into the room where Mrs. Yin lay on a cot in the corner, unresponsive. And they began, and they, they took time to worship, and then they began to pray for Mrs. Yin. And the question is, how did they begin to pray? Well, Merrill tells a story. He says, they began by taking authority first over the demonic realm. And as they began to exercise their authority and command the evil and malevolent spirits that were there to leave, Mrs. Yin suddenly bolts up from her cot in the corner, fully alert and obviously no longer paralyzed, and says, there's still one right over there. They turn and they rebuke the spirit. It flees, and in that moment, the family bends their knee and receives not only their salvation, not only their deliverance from, from darkness, but their commission to walk alongside God and receive his authority in their life. All three of the Yin sons soon became missionaries, spreading the gospel throughout their region and casting out demons wherever they went. And so likewise, when we follow Jesus, we must realize we don't rely on ourselves or our charisma or our understanding or any persuasive strategies, but we rely, I rely on the power of Jesus to break the chains of spiritual bondage in the hearts and the minds of our friends by revealing himself to them. I'm not Jesus. God, Jesus reveals himself he shines his light. And that is our prayer. And that is the vision that we need to reconnect with in, in a world addicted to busyness, compromise, disconnected from its true purpose. We need a vision of Jesus' power and an understanding that he desires to impart it to us. He desires not just to send us out so we are on our own. He desires to send us out in his power. And, and, and I know we, we can't look past that. That's who we are. That's the story of, 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 of every Christian. And when we realize that, the rest of the story that we're reading, we realize the force of it. The rest of the story in Mark opens up, and you can understand the challenge that he's trying to lay before us. And it's this. In the story of the sending out of the twelve, we are faced with a challenge. The challenge of whether we will prioritize God's vision for our, for our lives or continue to live at the beck and call of every urgent issue that arises in our busy lives. Who has the steering wheel of your soul? The offer is clear and it is compelling. It is 
certainly the kind of life we all want to live. Who doesn't want to live the life with authority from God, breaking down strongholds, shining his light and his love as we serve and give ourselves to him? But here's the thing, that's only the first story. The second story helps us understand the whole thing deeper, helps us understand that challenge of how how are we going to prioritize that vision of God. And here's what it helps us understand, that the pathway into that life, into that kind of life of, of following God wholeheartedly requires ruthless allegiance to Jesus' vision. You have to agree with him. And it doesn't happen by accident. We don't just fall into discipleship. In fact, we only enter into it through sacrifice. Can only do it by surrender. See, the story of Herod is a perfect example of what happens when we get tempted to take the path of least resistance in our lives. When we collapse the tension of Jesus' challenge to us by making ourselves somehow an exception to the rule. We let ourselves off the hook. We say, I'm going to follow Jesus, but this one thing I'm going to reserve the right to. This one opinion I'm going to reserve the right to. This one one habit I'm going to reserve the right to. Where we aren't just failing to obey, because everybody fails, but we're actually failing to care. See, Herod Antipas, and that's the Herod in our story, is a puppet king for Rome. He's a living example of of what it looks like to be compromised. He's a Jew by birth, right? He should be, you know, a strict strict adherence to Yahweh, and yet he's accepted the kingship of Rome. He said, I'm going to serve as your your, your vassal. He said, he's like the tax collectors, you know, in, in lots of ways hated by those who knew that he was compromising. He... He loved, and listen to the compromise in his life. He loves to hear John speak. He, he even fears his influence, and yet it changes nothing. It's a, it just creates perplexion in his heart, but it doesn't change anything. Herod is the kind of home that the disciples were called to shake, you know, shake off the dust off their feet at because he was unreceptive, listening but not changing, hearing but not responding. And what we find in Herod is that when we live halfway in our lives, following Jesus, trying to follow Jesus, we're always conflicted. It always, it always leads to, to turmoil. We end up confused about the truth, confused about Jesus, but feeling betrayed, enslaved to our lesser desires, not free to serve one master, but somehow torn between two. And Herod serves as a perfect illustration for almost all of the pitfalls and compromises we're warned to avoid in order to live radically and ruthlessly for God. Here's what I did. I actually put Herod, I did a little study. I put Herod side by side in comparison with Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Right? Jesus said this, and I kind of, what does that look like for Herod? And in almost in every case, Herod's decisions are the actual antithesis of Jesus. He's the, he's the anti-Christ. <laughs> Not the antichrist, but you know, he's an example of something that, is the exact opposite of Jesus. Listen, Jesus warns against adultery and divorce, and what do we find Herod doing? Taking his brother's wife for himself. That's a two for two. Jesus warns us against making oaths, right? About swearing by anything, and Herod writes a blank check to his wife's daughter that he ends up deeply regretting. He says, up to half my kingdom. That's ludicrous. Jesus warns against lust, And what do we find Herod doing? Him and his friends running a first century strip club starring his stepdaughter. It's disgusting. Jesus warns against taking vengeance from withholding forgiveness and calls us to love our enemies. And yet Herod's wife Herodias has John killed and Herod complies. And it's all because of her bitter grudge and and, and towards John telling the truth and then it's enabled by by Herod's cowardice. He's a coward. Jesus warns against pride and Herod decides he'd rather execute someone unjustly, murder someone, than go back on a promise he made in front of his friends while he was probably drunk so that he doesn't embarrass himself. 
There's even one place in the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus says this, and I, it's, it, it just struck me. He says, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask? And then you think about the gift that Herod gave to his stepdaughter. A man's head on a platter. Herod is so compromised, he can't even give good gifts to his children. And add to that, you know, we could add on top of that that he, that he had a guilty conscience that led him to believing that somehow, and this is what guilt does, it, it, it affects the way you see the world. He thought somehow Jesus was John the Baptist come back from the dead to haunt him. People are going, no, no, it's a prophet. No, no, it's, it's Elijah. And he's going, no, no, I know who it is. It's the guy I murdered. And he's coming back and he's, he's haunting me. <laughs> And then on top of that, he has an unhealthy desire for political power. He's compromised politically. And it eventually leads to his, um, his downfall, his corru- it leads to his downfall. And what we want to see in it, obviously each of those is a path that we must avoid. We've got to avoid you know, political allegiance above allegiance to God. We've got to avoid you know, lust and, and, and we've got to avoid you know, adultery. In our, in our hearts, we've got to avoid anger and rage and bitterness because all of these things lead to death. And this is the contrast Mark is employing. And in it, there's this deep truth that I need us to understand. That we will never grasp our, our authority. We will never deeply experience the power of God. We will never fully feel the freedom of God until we have accepted the totality of his vision for our lives, the the fullness of his will for our lives in every respect. Jesus is not just the truth and he's not just the life. Jesus' life is the way. He's the way. What I'm not saying somehow, please don't hear me saying this, that Jesus is not expecting perfect performance as we follow him, as 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 we lean into him. Because who else could remain? Who, who else could qualify then? In fact, that's the lie. Perf, you know, perfect performance. That's the lie that the enemy tells us to discourage us when he sees us trying to live by faith. He comes by and reminds us of our failure. And that is a lie from the enemy. The gospel is always a matter of faith. It's always what God has done for us and not what we've done for God. It's, it's, it's by faith, not works. This is a better way to understand it. Instead, it's better to say that Jesus, he doesn't require perfect performance. He requires total allegiance. Now you can be completely, you know, in allegiance to Jesus and yet still fail. So what does total allegiance mean? It means that we are going to be faithful despite our weaknesses. It means we're going to be, there's there's faithfulness even, even though we fail. There's persistence in our lives to come back to God, to run back to God, regardless of the resistance that we face, regardless of if our world gets turned upside down. Faithfulness does not look like failure or or giving in to worry sometimes. Perfection is not what Jesus is looking for. And when we realize that, it's hard to say no to that offer, isn't it? When we realize that the only thing left, if Jesus just requires our faithfulness, if that's what he's calling us into, to, to be faithful to him, to be completely allied towards his vision and his way and his kingdom, then the only thing we have to do is give ourselves. The only thing we have to do to say yes to God is to surrender to the call. To re- and, then, and then when we do, we receive power and we're sent out And what we do is then, as we live our life by faith, we trust all of the results to God. Everything. Every day is an an offering. Even this week as I was preparing, even this week as I was trying to, you know, go through my day-to-day, every day there's an opportunity to surrender, to sacrifice my life again, and then to leave all of the results before the Lord. It's actually a freeing way to live. Lord, would you receive this day, my life today? And this is where John witnesses to the truth. 
And that's what John does. He's the forerunner. And listen to the imagery. Listen to how it talks about John in the passage because he's, he's, he's kind of silent in the background. And yet he's speaking. Listen to his voice. John, like a lamb, is led to the slaughter. John is quiet before his accusers. John is sentenced unjustly before the political powers. An unjust trial. His life is offered up to appease the wicked and the crowd. It sounds like someone, doesn't it? It sounds like someone we know. And then it says this, His disciples gather his body and they lay him in a tomb. And this is what the story forces us to ask. Is the sacrifice going to be worth it? Was John's sacrifice, even though what it cost him his life, what happens when we give our lives to Jesus? What happens when we entrust all of the results to him? What happens when we surrender fully? John Mark Homer says this. He says, in Jesus, the answer to the question, is it worth it if I give my life? The answer is always yes. It is worth the cost. In fact, you get back far more than you give up. There's a cross, yes. A death, yes. But it's followed, your death is followed by an empty tomb, a new portal to life, because the way of Jesus, in the way of Jesus, death is always followed by resurrection. So this morning as we close, I want, us to, I want to pray for our vision. I want to pray for our vision as a church. I want to pray that we would have fresh encounter with the Spirit of God. I want to pray that we would understand and perceive the authority of Jesus that's upon your life. And that you would never settle for a busy or conflicted life again. There's going to be choices that we have to make. And I'm going to pray that we would learn how to be ruthless. Ruthlessly entering into life with God. Ruthless with our old life. Ruthless with the distractions. Ruthless about those things that are less important. That we would push back against the tyranny of the urgent and instead receive the easy yoke of the Spirit. I'm praying that you will not be afraid in your life, but you would rather be bold and courageous as you seek God, as you entrust Him with your life. That you would pick up that call to join Jesus, to be an agent just like the, the apostles were agent of freedom and grace, of good news, of authority and healing wherever you go, that the good news will resound in your life and it would be heard by all. So let me pray. Father, this morning, I thank you that it's not by might, it's not by power, it's not by our persuasive words, it's not even by, by preaching, Lord. Lord, but it's by your Spirit that you, that you awaken our souls to your life. You awaken us on the inside to believe and to see that there is a work that you're doing, that you have begun, that you are ready and working to complete, not only in our lives, but in the whole world. And I thank you that you have raised up a church and a people that want to follow you. And I ask God that you would, Lord, you would impart your, your, your grace upon them. You'd fill them with your spirit, the flame of the love and the power and the purity of God would be upon us, that we would live into your life. Lord, that we would, we would be witnesses of your power and your wisdom and your authority and your breakthrough and your freedom wherever we go. I pray, Father, for those who are sick this morning, that they would experience your healing touch upon their lives. I pray those who are bound up in lies, that you would break them off. I thank you that the authority of God is upon us. And we, we, Lord, we surrender to you. And we say yes to your will. Yes to your purposes. We say, Lord, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done here in this place as it is in heaven. I thank you, Father, that there is, Lord, nothing can hold you back. I thank you, God, that you are free this morning. That you are relaxed. That you are at peace and you are imparting that peace to us. I pray that you would set every prisoner free. I pray that the, the blind eyes would see. 
We, we ask, Lord, that you would renew our hearts. Lord, that we'd hear the call of the Spirit this morning. The call to follow you with our whole hearts. Teach us, God, how to say no to the old and yes to the new. Let your blessing and your grace rest upon your people in power and in joy. In your name, Jesus, amen.